All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Etten, and I'm a Vice President for Client Services at STEM Connector. It's our pleasure to have you with us today for our place-based considerations for developing a STEM workforce webinar. If you are a member of STEM Connector or have ever attended one of our events, then you have certainly heard us say that the STEM talent crisis is a complex systems problem. <clears throat> that the problem is not owned by any one player, but by the entirety of the STEM ecosystem. Scalable and sustainable solutions can only be brought to bear by a deep understanding of the pressures that influence the system, as well as the underlying challenges and require collaboration across boardrooms, classrooms, and communities. In our 2018 report, State of STEM, we described the five greatest barriers to building a diverse STEM workforce. A lack of fundamental skills that are necessary to succeed in the workforce, close held beliefs about the aptitude or traits young people must have to belong and thrive in STEM fields, inadequate or insufficient post-secondary credentials, disproportionate participation in STEM jobs based on race, gender, and income, and a geographic disconnect between talent and opportunity. Today, we are honored to welcome Brian Hancock, a partner at McKinsey & Company, and Sean Thurman, Director of Global Public Policy at Walmart, to discuss some of the STEM-relevant findings from the report, America at Work, a National Mosaic and Roadmap for Tomorrow. America at Work considers geography from another perspective. The report examines the capacity of individual communities to respond to changes brought on by automation and develop collaborative responses that position its residents for success in a changing economy. Could you advance the slides, please? Brian is a partner in the Washington DC office of McKinsey and Company, and he is the global leader of McKinsey's talent practice. He is one of McKinsey's leading researchers on the future of work and co-hosts co the podcast, McKinsey Talks Talent. Brian has published papers on a variety of human capital topics beyond the future of work, including performance management's digital shift in the MIT Sloan Management Review, redesigning knowledge work in the Harvard Business Review, and the economic cost of the achievement gap in America's schools in the Teachers College Record. Sean, is the Director of Global Public Policy, leading workforce, labor, and employment policy efforts for Walmart. Prior to joining Walmart, Sean served as Labor Policy Advisor to Chairman Lamar Alexander and the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Before I turn this over to our speakers, I want to let you know that we will have time for Q&A at the end of this presentation. So please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. And also we will send around the slides and the recording in a follow-up email next week. And with that, Sean, Brian, take it away. Great, thanks, Amy. Uh, the, the biggest takeaway from the intro was also that Sean grew a work from home beard and does not look at all like his headshot. Uh, I definitely need to get that updated. Uh, but thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to to speak to this audience today and just wanted to also thank STEM Connector for the ongoing partnership between between Walmart and your consortium. Um, obviously, it's uh, very important to us as we uh, continue to grow and evolve into what we call an omni-channel retailer, which is just a fancy word for we sell things in a physical location and we sell things online. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. And in order to get that right, uh, it takes uh, a lot of, of talent behind the scenes, um, software engineers, uh, uh, other, other experts uh, throughout our business. And uh, my colleague, Sarah Davis, uh, who was um, uh, instrumental in, in making this connection and her teams uh, have been uh, really focused on making sure that, uh, that not only is our talent pipeline uh, con continually uh, uh, refined and improved uh, to, to access these types of abilities and skills in our economy, but also that we get bigger awareness over uh, the the ongoing issue around trying to 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 narrow these gaps uh, in in our education systems and our workforce systems, as you said, collaboration across the STEM ecosystem is is extremely key. Um, 
but to even take it a step further and and you'll see kind of uh, in this presentation what we've um, covered uh, here um, sorry just double checking my audio here uh, you'll see that we are focused uh, equally on making sure that we are uh, coordinating across disciplines and that goes for communities uh, of similar kind, communities of different types, uh, and also all the varied institutional uh, uh, players that are involved from public policy to the education system, the workforce system, and, and other players, especially as you get closer to the local level uh, and how important that is uh, to uh, achieve positive outcomes uh, in, in the future economy. Let me go ahead and share my uh, screen so we can get going with the just a handful of slides to kind of guide us through uh, uh, an overview of both the America at Work report, which was uh, in some ways a starting point to, to this work, but also uh, Brian will uh, be able to uh, speak to both reports uh, that we'll be talking about, both the, the Walmart America at Work report and subsequent work that McKinsey has done uh, in this space uh, to, to take our, our very quick uh, project and expand upon it in a number of ways. Uh, so why don't we just go ahead and jump on in. Um, so first of all, uh, you know, it makes sense to start at the bottom of the slide, right? Um, the full report, uh, for those that are interested, uh, can view that at walmart.com slash American Life. Uh, that'll take you to a blog post that sort of sets things up and you can actually access the full uh, PDF of the report uh, at, at that location. You can also link out uh, to a Tableau-enabled uh, map that we put together that takes this this static uh, mosaic map that you see here and allows you to uh, click into it, uh, do some comparative, uh, you know, analysis. I always encourage people to jump into the map, look at your home county, look at the county you went to school in, look at where you might be working today and kind of see where it falls on this map. Um, and as, as, as I sort of walk through it at a high level, you know, you'll quickly see uh, a, f a few things uh, just on what is displayed here. You, you can quickly uh, zoom in and identify uh, major urban areas, particularly on the on the eastern part of the country. Um, but what's really interesting in the work that we did was we were able to, um, by taking a county level approach to our analysis, we were able to uh, really diversify the um, the, the 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 way that we uh, view uh, what's referred to as rural America, or at least um, exurban America. It's, uh, so uh, six of these eight community types that the report ultimately creates um, have some level of uh, of, of uh, a rural element to them in some way. So. The report itself, uh, as Amy said, examines community resiliency and, and whether or not those communities have the assets and the capacity to address changes associated with the future of work. Um, our proxy for, for the changes and challenges with the future of work uh, it, it was automation in this case. Um, we were, uh, you know, everyone is talking about uh, the future of work. Uh, they were definitely talking about it in 2019. Uh, people talked about many other things in, in 2020, but it, 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 it is an ongoing thread that we are seeing in the economy. Uh, so uh, we used McKinsey's uh, automation uh, uh, database as, um, as, as a gauge for assessing the the uh, the impact that we think automation will have, and then what we did was look at a very broad range of uh, other factors that impact community resiliency, and uh, what we and, and just to strip it down, basically we took all of these data points. We used about sixty. Uh, 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 data sources and more than 600 data points individually, and uh, they apply to each county around the country. And we essentially compared every county to every other county in the United States um, and, and ran through that exercise. And ultimately, we arrived at uh, what we initially called clusters, but became community archetypes. And those are the, um, those are the color-coded uh, uh, county identifications that you see on this map. 
Um, we gave them, you know, we tried to give them descriptive names, uh, ways that you can kind of understand what you're looking at, especially if you're not as familiar with a particular area. You know, we wanted this to be something that, that we could look at coast to coast, Alaska, Hawaii, everything. Um, we also wanted to be extremely inclusive of those rural com communities that I was talking about before. And uh, one way to do this was obviously to look at the county level uh, data uh, in order for it to kind of, for us to kind of be able to have a uniform look at this uh, across the country. And um, because this was a, uh, a an undertaking uh, that uh, the public policy team, which I serve on at Walmart, uh, wanted to produce, we wanted to make sure that we, uh, you know, that not only did we have sort of the aha moments of of the map and and what it could mean, but also, you know, a so what, what uh, so so the report will go on to talk about recommendations that we think policymakers uh, uh, should uh, strongly consider in order to increase the, the the capacity to address these changes, and then we broke that down into six principal categories which um, I think for this audience uh, will will come as, as no surprise and will make sense because you are doing quite a bit of this uh, in terms of um, uh, increasing awareness of, of, of STEM work and of things like the skills gap. So um, retraining and upskilling, obviously boosting mobility in the labor market, building and maintaining uh, infrastructure and in when we talk about that, we're talking about physical infrastructure, but we're also talking about the need for digital infrastructure, uh, particularly uh, after after the last year that we had with a lot of remote work, remote learning, uh, telehealth, those types of things. Um, you know, it it it's simple but can't be overstated. Creating new jobs, um, modernizing the social safety net is something that we need to continue to be thinking about, and obviously strengthening education. I mean, it goes hand in hand with retraining and upskilling. But in 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 some ways it, it is distinct, and so the main takeaway uh, behind the report is that in order to uh, sort of get this right across all of those areas, it requires collaboration uh, across multiple stakeholder groups. Um, there's a federal federal element when it comes to uh, funding, for example. Uh, states and localities uh, administering uh, funding from from various government programs. There's also at the state and local level a better awareness of of what local communities need. Um, businesses, you know, companies like Walmart, small and mid-sized businesses as well, working hand in hand with community leaders. Um, we wanted to also uh, call attention to the fact that individual residents, people who um, are, are committed to the vitality of their community uh, should should not be overlooked as well. Um, there's a role for philanthropy. Uh, you know, the the Walmart.org uh, group, which is used to be called the Walmart Foundation, uh, has been really focused on uh, creating uh, skill upskilling and, and opportunity in the retail sector, for example. But uh, yeah, that's that's just one of many uh, potential stakeholders, and obviously the educational institutions. So. Um, from a from a policy person's background, this is this is really key because uh, at the state level and at the at the federal level, particularly, a lot of these a lot of these intersecting um, uh, policy areas and responses are being handled uh, in committee uh, verticals. You know, you have the education committee, you have a committee focused on healthcare, a committee focused on infrastructure. You have all these. All the all this work getting done, um, but it really requires um, some overarching coordination and some understanding of the of the pieces that fit. Um, one of the things that we emphasize in the report is that um, you know, for example, if you're in uh, a, a community that is is labeled distressed Americana for the purposes of this map, um, there are a number of sort of prerequisite policy areas that that probably need to be addressed before you can necessarily get to uh, a, a retraining and upskilling exercise. You, you know, you likely need to look at infrastructure and make sure that, you know, there's there's effective broadband, that there's effective uh, community college networks, those types of things. So it's all about 
these six principal responses are the are the overarching areas that communities need to focus on in order to uh, address changes that could come with automation. Uh, but uh, if, if they're done in the wrong order, if they're if they're not prioritized at the appropriate level, then you know the 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 house of cards kind of can potentially fall down. And so this is um, one one thing we did not want to do was be overly prescriptive with the uh, with the responses that we put together. Um, a number of reasons for that, but chiefly communities are going to understand uh, better than than we do um, behind a research desk, understanding what uh, what particular local context, um, local history, uh, culture, those types of things that 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 matters, too. Uh, and so we're strictly looking at this from a data standpoint. And um, these community types uh, are not value judgments on individual communities. It's just simply this is what these are what the this is what the numbers uh, show uh, as we look through all of these data points. I'm jumping ahead just a little bit to give you a sense of some of the many categories. This is not exhaustive of, of what we looked at as we determined resiliency. Um, so as you can see, a lot of data points went into this. Um, we're happy to, to share these slides for folks later. There's there's no need to to look at this eye chart too hard, but um, and, and we can go back to it if there are any questions. This is more of a, a summation of it. We looked at it in terms of these five major categories, human capital, innovation, development indicators, socioeconomic factors, and economic base. Um, you know, rather than look at uh, the, the, you know, the, the threat or opportunity of automation uh, uh, specifically, it's actually all of this a uh, holistic ecosystem around that that we think is really important for communities to be focused on. So, so we pulled from all these um, uh, data categories and and in order to build this uh, the resiliency map that we put together. Um, so, uh, I think the 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 biggest takeaway for us was, you know as we look at the changes that are likely to occur related to automation and other technology, there is, um, there, there's going to be a need for lifelong learning, for continual upskilling. Um, people who are in a, uh, in, in a role or in a career right now that is going to be uh, impacted in some way uh, by these technological factors. It may not be that the job overall goes away, but it could certainly be that certain tasks that were done, uh, uh, you know, with more of a human element are going to be able to be to be automated or uh, aided by technology, and that's going to create roles that are really, you know. A jumbling up of, of existing tasks into new roles. That's that's certainly the experience that we've uh, been seeing at Walmart. We we have a number of new responsibilities uh, within our stores. For those of you that have either interacted with us online or interacted with us in the stores, you've certainly seen um, grocery pickup, uh, delivery, those types of things are are growing. And there's obviously a technological element to that. Um, there's a higher skill level of folks that are that are that are picking those orders uh, and making sure that we you know are doing it to the to to the to a quality that our customers come to expect. And so um, as as we see these roles uh, you know continue to evolve, it's going to be important that, uh, that that communities kind of understand what they have to bear. I've I've put this slide up here just uh, so that you all could kind of take a look at it behind my 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 talk track here. But um, it, it just short uh, summaries of the community types that that we've put together here. Um, just to, just to call out a couple, I, I mentioned one distressed Acona, Americana. Um, largely southern uh, uh, counties, but it, you certainly see uh, distressed Americana counties uh, in the west, uh, in the upper, uh, in the northeast and upper Midwest. Um, you know, generally seeing population decline, uh, seeing uh, uh, lower uh, educational attainment, higher unemployment. Um, one of the, you know, we just offer an example here, and it gives you a sense of the number of counties that are included in this. And the populations uh, that kind of fall into these categories. We certainly didn't want to create eight community types that were exactly the same number of people, exactly the same number of counties. It's really what the data showed back to us. Uh, you know, I'll call out the Great Escapes right next to the Distressed Americana description. That's only 14 counties. 
um, and and less than a million people. But they are the you know communities like that are are so unique uh, with respect to being uh, in 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 what we've come to think of as a rural setting. But these are you know. Uh, tourist destinations. These are places where, uh, you know, uh, con uh, you know, conferences and things like that are happening. We joke that it's, these are the places that people go to to talk about the future of work. And, you know, maybe they should be going to places like Distressed Americana instead to get a really un a good understanding of what's going on. Um, my only postscript on that is that with respect to the changes that we've seen, it, that we saw in 2020 and that continue to, to, to impact the economy, People aren't traveling to these places anymore. You know, it's uh, you know, it, it is it is less likely that they that their economies will be propped up in the way that they've come to expect uh, in in the coming years, uh, and and could take several years as as travel comes comes uh, comes back. So um, so this isn't meant to necessarily be a, a static snapshot. It's meant to be a little resilient itself in terms of how communities are are viewed. Uh, but, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I, I would just say this, that while we put this report together in, in 20, late 2018 and early 2019, um, and, you know, we talked a lot about it uh, in, in the months leading up to, to 2020, you know, we were looking at, um, you know, the likelihood that we were going to see uh, potentially large scale uh, impact on on jobs and on on the economy over a long period of time. Um, the 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 estimates on you know the number of jobs that that are you know, tasks that could be automated over five or ten years. I mean, those are the timeframes we were thinking about. With 2020, um, obviously, we saw uh, and and they're continuing to experience you know widespread job displacement. Uh, as a result of the the COVID nineteen uh, 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 public public health pandemic and uh, the ensuing uh, economic impacts, uh, so there's still I think some relevancy to viewing communities through uh, through a lens like this, um, it, perhaps all perhaps even more urgently uh, because uh, it is still. Uh, there is a need for for federal and state involvement, public policy involvement. But you know, communities are also, uh, as as they always are, in some ways on their own to kind of understand what they need to do and how they need to uh, adapt to changing circumstances. And so, um, both and and I should say, this is not the only way uh, to 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 look at uh, the the communities around the country. Um, if if it were, then <laughs> then Brian would take issue with that because Brian has actually done a great job of taking some of the limitations of the report that that we put together and uh, was able to drill down on them. For example, just to just to set him up a little bit, um, you can see that that um, you know when you take a county uh, approach to uh, analyzing th something like community resiliency, you're going to run into uh, some 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 trouble. Uh, you know, you can look at some of the, especially as you get out west, you see the counties are so large, they're so diverse, and some of them are, are popping in our data sets as urban centers and core suburbs. But if you look at Southern California there, I don't think anybody's going to be considering the, uh, the, the eastern part of the state as an urban center by any means. And so, um, there, there is obviously the necessity to uh, in in those in those more populated areas to to drill down and and and, and break those down into uh, more uh, understandable pieces. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, another another big takeaway here is um, this is this is a, a reflection on on data. And really, I think we looked more or less within the, the last five or six years. From a data standpoint, so um, it, it, the, this data isn't necessarily going to reflect the, the historical context of, you know, for example, um, coal country. You know that you know obviously a, a, a once um, you know heavily industrial, uh, you know, prosperous uh, area that that is currently kind of experiencing a, a downturn. Uh, again, not a value judgment. It's just uh, this. This is where our communities currently fall on the map uh, as 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 we analyze them. So um, 
uh, an, enough for me. I want to make sure Brian has an opportunity to kind of show uh, how this uh, how this report uh, shifted into the work uh, that McKinsey engaged in last year. Uh, again, to to look at how um, more more densely populated communities break down even further from the work that we did, but also um, some of the other uh, factors that need to be taken into account, particularly demographics, um, uh, race, gender, those types of things. It, you know, also important for us to be taking a, a, a close look at as as we uh, look to help our communities. So, without further ado, uh, why don't I throw it over to Brian? And Brian, I'll I'm, I can drive these slides. Just let me know how you want me to move ahead. Great. Well, I'll just uh, thank you, Sean, and it's uh, great to be with you all. Uh, I thought maybe just pause here to give a few reflections on this, and then we'll show a couple of pages and, and I think open it up to, to questions. So as Sean said, what we did is we took the initial segmentation, which we thought was very um, interesting because it did look at um, urban and rural uh, in a different context. It showed what a real diversity of communities you have, and there's no such thing as a single rural solution. You actually have to think about whether, you know, you're in upstate uh, North Dakota, or whether you're in Oklahoma County, Mississippi, or whether you're in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, those communities are different. And when you get to those differences, you start to see the kinds of solutions that can apply and also can cross over in interesting ways. You know, the upper part of the mitt of Michigan actually has, from an economic base, a lot in common with um, the rural South. And so seeing those connections can actually be useful making programs. But the initial report did have this big category called um, urban and core suburbs. And when you look at it, you, you recognize that, you know, Seattle and Detroit look different in a growth trajectory in where they're going and in, in what the pieces uh, are. And even, you know, places like Baltimore, and if you separate that out from uh, the Washington DC area, even though it's one big uh, combined area, you can start to see nuances within it. So we wanted to take that, that city view. And when we had that city view, we were able to kind of expand the number of city segments to more reflect, hey, these are the types of cities that can learn from each other um, and do a little bit more granular piece there in a way similar to what we had done rurally. The next thing we did is we said, okay, where do we think job growth is going to be over the next, you know, through 2030? And this is a combination of looking at underlying growth and momentum, looking at population, looking at the pieces, that go into projections of growth, also looking at what's gonna happen with technology and automation in those communities. So where, how do we see these patterns happening? And once we understand job growth, we understand an occupation level, um, what's happening, we can then play for, well, who are in those occupations today? What's the mix of gender, race, age, educational attainment? And given what we expect shifts to happen, you know, how does that play forward in terms of you know, what demographic groups you know, do we need to think about? And then we're able to expand that as well, having looked at an occupation level, hey, what are the implications for different types of workers and workforce? But it, so in other words, this came down to two fundamental advancements. One, you know, looking a little more granular at the cities. And then secondly, you know, looking at job growth and who would benefit from that and where. And so if you go forward, Sean. Uh, so now this is the next level of, you know, expanding. Uh, the segments were uh, largely the same in the rural areas. We grouped together a few of the rural outliers, the small, smaller rural segments that Sean referred. We can expand those back uh, as useful. But here you had, you know, you can see we had quite a bit of segmentation among the cities. And if you go forward a page, Sean, what one of the things that we saw in looking at this is, you know, what was the annual employment by um, when you looked at it from a city um, angle, when you had layered cities on top of it. And what we found is, you know, Americana and distressed Americana, as of 2017, um, 2018, had not yet fully recovered jobs from the last recession. Whereas our high growth hubs had, you know, had tremendous, you know, grew 14% jobs from the last recession. So we saw certain cities winning more than others, certain regions winning more than others, but it wasn't just an urban rural mix. I mean, we saw some uh, more rural areas uh, growing, 
uh, small powerhouses or silver cities. You know, these these are areas that you wouldn't you know have more in common with a, a smaller town feel than a mega city. You know, those were growing, uh, and some of our trailing cities, places like Flint, Michigan, looked more like Americana and um, you know had a slower rate of growth. So that's how we looked. And then when we added up, so, so what's it mean in overall job growth? If you go to the next page, yeah, it means it's gonna be concentrated in a relatively small set of cities. So we thought 60% of net job creation through 2030 may be in just 25 urban areas. Today, these urban areas represent about 40% of jobs. So we saw a continuous, you know, a continuing movement uh, towards these uh, urban areas. Um, you know, one of the frequent questions we get is how do we think the pandemic has changed this? I think, you know, there's still a need for connectivity. There's still a need for people um, working. And actually some of the things we're seeing is companies with headquarters in areas that are like an Americana community are thinking about, well, how do I put my IT center where there are a bunch of other IT folks, like in the Washington DC area in Northern Virginia. So we, while we do see some instances of like, hey, I might not have to be in New York, I can, I can live and commute from Montana, we're also seeing companies in more rural communities say, hey, now that we've learned how to work remotely, maybe we can have six or seven satellite offices, one in Austin, one in um, Atlanta, one in Northern Virginia, et cetera. So while this will continue to be refined, and I think we'll learn a lot more uh, once we get the vaccine, and once people return to work, we think the general movement here, that growth is going to continue to be concentrated in a few areas, is likely to be the uh, uh, still the dominant story. And I'll just touch on one other um, page here. If we go forward one, Sean, um, or maybe two others. Here, this, this is when we looked at the job growth. And so here, what we're trying to say is, you know, where do we see job growth through 2030? And how does that link up versus where employment sits today? So in the lower right-hand side of the, the page here, we have areas that have big employment, but where we see employment numbers decreasing as a percent of 2017 employment as a result of automation and other factors. Things like office support uh, are actually one of the uh, biggest areas. So office support could be um, administrative assistance. Office support could also be clerical work that is, you know, basic data entry that now can be automated. It can also be things like automotive claims, where as AI, you know, when you're at an accident scene, you can take a picture and have the computer do the first pass at what the damage and how much it could be. Those are the things that are at risk from office support. So it's a big category, but a lot of it is um, where a lot can be automated. The upper left, you see health professional STEM as some of the ones that are um, highest growing uh, fields. I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody uh, on this. Uh, and we also see you know, some of the areas of you know, managers, education, workforce training, customer service, and sales are as big, but also still growing. Because one of the things is when you can automate, as one of my colleagues says, when you can automate the dull and the dangerous, when you can automate the you know, routine work, what's left is what's human. And what's human is some of the creative element, but also the interactive element. And so when you think about, you know, discovery in, in STEM fields, when you think about leading a team, when you think about persuading somebody, um, you know, those are all human skills, uh, soft skills that may in the future be power skills. Um, you know, and we see those being important going forward. When you lay this on demographics, which is the next page, um, you know, you see that the displacement is four times higher for workers with a high school diploma or less. There are 11.9 million uh, Hispanic and African-American workers um, be displaced, about 15 million young workers, uh, and uh, between 11 and 12 million workers age 50 and above. And one thing to point out is that while this is over-indexed for younger workers, and for workers with a high school diploma or less, every job is going to have some degree of automation. Every job is gonna have some degree of change uh, as it goes forward. So while these are folks, when if you look in the aggregate, have the highest percentage of their job changing, for everybody work is changing in some 
uh, some real way. So that's how we built on the report. And, you know, would love, uh, Sean, if you had anything to add, and otherwise we might open it up. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I mean, just just the one main takeaway here is, and, and Brian alluded to it, is, you know, 2020 was, uh, was obviously a, a very different year. It created um, some some extremely unanticipated uh, impacts on on the overall economy, on on jobs, on specific sectors, uh, and continues to do so. Let's let's be honest. Um, as as Brian said, it, it remains to be seen how much permanent change uh, we we experience going forward in terms of how people work, uh, and that's really important as we look at place being uh, a, a factor in uh, looking at at these issues, at, at the overall uh, health of the economy and the workforce, and then specifically with with STEM work. Um, obviously, what what can be uh, what can be done from uh, from from far flung places? Um, how can people uh, uh, gravitate toward or or go back to uh, some of those communities that are are less seen as 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 the hubs? Uh, of of certain industries and sectors going into uh, going going into the, the the year we had, so um, it'll be really interesting to see. Uh, you know, from from a Walmart perspective, you know, our our global tech organization uh, that, as I said, is is sort of the the back end and backbone to all of the work that we're doing uh, that that the customer sees on on their end. Um, you know, we have gone to a largely remote work uh, uh, set up there, and uh, there is no expiration date on that necessarily. Um, we're working through that. We're looking at what makes sense in terms of uh, getting teams together, you know, collaboration, those types of things. But, you know, to what extent these shifts stay permanent is going to impact, uh, obviously, what uh, what communities, particularly, you know, a little bit further down the, the rural side of the rural urban continuum uh what they can hope to uh, be able to uh, achieve uh in this shift and as as you know getting back to those um six principal policy responses um if if there is uh if if there are some shifts uh outside of these these main job centers uh e even slightly uh the communities that are ready to receive that uh, that opportunity are, are going to be the ones that are going to be able to truly succeed. Um, if you don't have, you know, good 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 broadband infrastructure, uh, good uh, you know c community services, uh, you know, proximity to hospitals and schools, and all those things that that we need in our in our lives, um, the communities that have those things already are going to be able to um, to access those uh, in greater numbers. And so, you know, you look at uh, Americana or the small independent economies versus the distressed Americana for the purpose in the in the Walmart report. Um, you know, and you can really see, you know, if if those things aren't there, uh, then you know those opportunities can can pass them by. And it's particularly important uh, with respect to. Um, you know, those distressed communities, because as we found out, um, and the report goes into this a little bit, these are communities that have not just sort of missed out on the latest round of, of economic prosperity, but they, it's been a compounding issue over, over many decades. And so, um, you know, it's, it's not, not the first uh, economic upswing that, that some communities haven't been able to take advantage of. So this is really important. Um, the last thing I'll say is just you know why? Why did Walmart do this? Uh, well, you know we are uh, we ninety percent of the U.S. population lives within ten miles uh, of a Walmart. We have uh, almost five thousand locations if you include our Sam's Club formats as well. And uh, so we're in in a lot of parts of the country uh, and have a presence in those communities. Um, and and we have a workforce that that comes out of those communities, and so we want to make sure that uh, you know the the communities that we serve are are as vibrant uh, as 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 you know as our companies have the fortune to be. Uh, and 
even though uh, we are in a lot of places and, and those, that statistic is a little eye popping about proximity to the population, we're still only in 2000 of the 3113 counties that we looked at. And so, you know, it just it just gives you a sense of the, you know, it gives you a sense of scale of Walmart, but it gives you a sense of scale of, of this country and, um, and and where people live and, uh, and and what life is like in, in different parts of the country. And as, as, uh, as Brian said, you know, the, the county next door to you may look different from this resiliency uh, uh, analysis, may look very different from you uh, that, and, and you may look, you know, your, your community may look more like something in, in another part of the country that you don't even know. And obviously history and culture and all those things, um, make us, make us and our experiences distinct. But, um, I think there's some insight into that too, on how communities can, um, can, can band together and can sort of compare notes, uh, between one another. And hopefully, um, you know, the, the reports and, and approaches to, to, um, economic resiliency like this can uh, open people's perspectives to, uh, you know, potentially some partners that they wouldn't otherwise think they have. Uh, so, so with that, um, I'll, I'll uh, we'll, we'll wrap up here. We really appreciate the opportunity to, um, uh, to cover uh, uh, this for you. And um, as I said, uh, the, the report is, uh, is, is available online. Um, you can go in and and sort of uh, jump into the map and uh, look at it, and hopefully it elicits some insights and, and some questions that you might have. And we're more than happy to to, to circle back uh, after you've had a chance to take a look at it and uh, you know address any questions that you might have then, but can definitely answer some now. Thanks, Amy. Thank you both so much. Um, I am a huge fan of this report. I keep it close by at all times. Um, and it, it just, it really gives me a lot to think about when I work with our members as we're thinking about the solutions that are most relevant for their STEM talent challenges. Um, we have a, a couple of really good questions that came through in the Q and A. I just wanna remind um, guests that if you do have questions to please use the Q and A feature. Um, so let's see. Uh, I'm going to start, um, I think, if it's okay, um, with one for Brian. Brian, you mentioned um, soft skills or power skills, or some people call them employability skills. And um, one of our guests asked whether you thought it was important to identify and quantify these specific soft skills or life competencies um, as you're thinking about um, building uh, in a market beyond the traditional educational models. Do you think that's an important uh, consideration? So I do think getting specific on what we think, um, you know, soft skills are really gonna be and ways of measuring them and communicating progress against them. I mean, today the most commonly cited soft skill is communications. And when you think about communications, that's actually an aggregate of a number of different underlying skills. It is the ability to synthesize and see what is in the data. It's an ability to understand your audience and how you're going to connect to the audience. It's a link. I mean, there are a number of things under there that when somebody is looking for that skill, what they actually mean. I think being specific in you know, what those underlying pieces are, are as important as the overall skill. Because if someone hears communication and they associate that with Toastmasters, well, Toastmasters is very important on one part of the communication one part of a public speaking, whereas actually when um, communication is often mentioned in a job context, it is that meta skill that, that people actually mean what's underneath it. So I think it is important to define that and define how you're gonna measure it. And what's cool is there are all sorts of new assessment tools um, to help you both define and then measure whether in a structured interview uh, or on a more traditional assessment. Thanks, Brian. Um, Sean, I have one for you. Um, given perceived and real government paralyzation at multiple levels, what do you think are some realistic wins within reskilling and education specifically that can be driven by partnerships between stakeholders? Uh, just confirming, given the polarization, is that, was that what oh, the question um, was? 
um, just given some of the perceived and real, it says given perceived and real government paralyzation, what do you think are some oh, realistic? I got it. <laughs> some realistic ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. If 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 government is moving slow or not at all, uh, what what are we supposed to do? Uh, is is absolutely um, a, a key question. I think. Well, first of all, I would say that I think engagement from non-governmental uh, uh, entities and stakeholders in the public policy process is really essential, and that's um, that. There's responsibility on both sides, right? Policymakers need to understand uh, that they need to, uh, you know, hear from and 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 gain from the insights and expertise of of stakeholders across the board, um, not just special interests, but um, really uh, getting to uh, the the experts and and the people who are actually dealing with these situations. It's important to get. I think it's important for those policymakers to get a balanced viewpoint on some of these things too if if um if policymakers are only hearing from uh you know uh, a, a well organized you know a, a advocacy group on on education for example th they could drown out the voice of you know the needs of of the workforce system so i think and i think that can be improved by really good coordination on behalf of the of the broader stakeholder community it's it's important to um connect with uh, stakeholders and 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 folks that comprise this ecosystem that you talked about in the day to day, week to week, month to month work that that folks do. It's you know in some ways like hop off the 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 meeting and convening circuit that you're most familiar with and step into you know to try to step into some of those other areas as well. I just in being able to go around and kind of talk about this report. Um, in front of different stakeholder groups, people are, you know, I, I've noticed people kind of pulling out different insights and taking away different things in, you know, depending on, on uh, what their unique focus is. So I've benefited from hearing all these different um, viewpoints. And so I think that's, that's one way uh, to, to really help policymakers understand this issue in a way that's not niche it's you know this isn't just we need this one thing done we need this one particular aspect in this one particular bill or regulation i think it's important to yes those things need to be achieved and and we there are things we need to reform and modernize i'll get to that in just a second but i think um you know understanding that it's an interplay and um you know chiefly as the report says like it may your first step if you're wanting to achieve a particular in goal on the policy side may not be the policy provision that you're necessarily pushing. There may need there may be other things that need to be put in place before that can be effective. It's you know you can improve your um, you know you you can you can implement a, a, a reskilling program for a particular uh, in demand uh, uh, job or field in a particular community. But if those jobs don't exist in that community, then you know what? What was that for? Um, you know, and and you know, it's it's not a hypothetical example. I mean, that that type of thing does does go on. Um, so it's you know, you really got to understand your area and how how it plays into the bigger picture. I would say just on on specifics in terms of things that um, that that need to be done on the on the policy front. Um, obviously, I, I I think one of the things that can that, that this group particularly could be really helpful with is helping policymakers understand the value of um, the the array of workforce skills and educational attainment options and that time, seat time, things like that don't necessarily equate to quality. They, they're not exclusive to that. So shorter term programs, um, you know, uh, credentialing and, you know, we're kind of calling it badging within Walmart, those types of things um, can can be really uh, helpful to convey people's, you know, educational attainment, their learning records, those th th those types of things. And policymakers at the federal level are just now starting to kind of grasp uh, the need for that. So as, as higher education funding reauthorization comes up, as workforce funding reauthorization comes up, Getting um, 
getting those policymakers to understand how how far the the education and workforce worlds have evolved is really key um, because if if we just continue to reauthorize legislation that was created in 1986 and you know things like that then then yes it, 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 we are helping some institutions we are helping some people but we could be helping a, a I think a broader uh, broader swath of people in in terms of modernizing some of these um, major pieces of legislation. But it takes um, it takes uh, the ability to um, work in a bipartisan fashion. It, you know, it, it it is a challenge. But um, you know, continuing to, to 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 push the issue to the forefront, I think, is really important. And the more diverse that coalition looks uh, in terms of the interest it's looking to serve, I think, the better for all of us. Sorry, long answer, but good question. No, that's great. Thank you, Sean. Um, Brian, uh, here's one I think for you. Um, you know, what was the most surprising finding from your community archetype analysis and how did that shift the way that you were thinking going into the work? Uh, you know, I think the, I think one of the, um, findings that was probably intuitive to the Walmart folks who are in these communities every day, but I think was something that stuck out to me once we got in there, is how similar certain communities are from an economic standpoint, from a, um, from a levers that they have for workforce development standpoint, how similar communities in very different parts of the country look like. So there's a lot that the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont which, you know, the Kingdom mountain biking trails are up there, but, you know, it's one of the, the it's, an, it's a distressed Americana segment, has in, in common with Cahoma County, Mississippi, has in common with some of the places in Michigan. And when you look at the underlying, you know, so like, no, no, the, the one's in the deep south and one's in the northeast and the ski mountain bike community and the others in Michigan, go blue, you know, every one of those communities looks and feels very different. But when you look under, you're like, actually, there's a lot of similarities there in the learnings and the policy. The other thing was how in one state you can have seven segments. You look at the state of Georgia, for example. You know, you've got Atlanta, which is an urban core in the core suburbs of Atlanta. You've got the urban periphery. You've got the smaller independent economies of places like Savannah. You know, you've got Americana, which is um, like Peach County, where the blue... Um, bird bus factory is. I mean, a lot of segments in one state. And so as states like Georgia, just as an example, you know, seeing their ability as policymakers to not be like, oh, it's Atlanta and the rest of the state of Georgia. As you got Atlanta and this, well, actually Atlanta is the urban periphery and the core of Atlanta and the rest of Georgia actually looks different. And the, the ability to which like this report has helped bring nuance to that conversation, both within localities and across localities. Again, it's something that Walmart, I feel like knows because they're in these communities, but as, as the uh, researcher coming in and then seeing it and then seeing how it resonated, I found that to be particularly interesting. We certainly had a, we, we just to add on there, we, I mean, we certainly had a, an inkling uh, of these types of things. We, we thought we would um, find them out, but we, but we were equally surprised at, um, at, at, at how things uh, uh, did pop up. And I, and I think um, with, with, with time and especially, I don't, I don't know about the audience, but, you know, we've done a lot more car travel than air travel uh, in the last uh, 12 months. <laughs> I'm sure Brian's done a lot less air travel than he's used to, but um, you know, th these things are less surprising as we've kind of been able to explore the communities around us, or, or maybe, you know, maybe some of you have, have been able to go across the country and, and see these changes as you go from town to town. Um, I would say just the, the, to add on to the, to the Walmart insight there, I think, um, the the other thing that um, was interesting to find was there was not there was not necessarily um, a correlation between um, store count in our in the community types 
and a percentage of uh, Walmart employment as a, as a percentage of the overall working population. So there are places where we might have fewer stores, but as a proportion of the employment picture, we, we have a much larger footprint. And so those insights, um, you know, it, they're, they're interesting uh, just on their face, but those insights have been really helpful uh, to, to decisions that, that we've made as a, as a business. Um, just that mindfulness uh, to, to layer on to, you know, a very large company with a lot of moving parts who's very, very good at looking at the, um, the, the, the situational awareness within the box, you know, within the store and, and within the business itself. But to be able to understand how it connects to the communities around us um, is, is something that a lot, of, a lot of different groups within the business have been appreciative of, of having that insight going forward. Thank you. Um, one last one, uh, well, just a short one. Can you imagine a scenario under, uh, under which there might be an opportunity to attract uh, workers and opportunities to rural areas? Or do you believe that the cities will continue to be the destination for STEM talent? I mean, so I'll, I'll jump in there. I mean, I think it depends what we mean by rural. I think what we see in Distressed Americana is that there is a challenge in having broadband access to those communities. So Sean teed up, you know, all the different types of infrastructure. Solving that infrastructure need is going to be a prerequisite for somebody moving. Because you may have somebody move from Silicon Valley to Tahoe because it's still within a three hour drive and you got to get to the office, but you can be remote and do fun things in Tahoe. Or you may have somebody move from Northern Virginia to Charlottesville. Again, a two hour drive you know, beautiful, not that Charlottesville is particularly rural, but you know, um, you, know you, you may have people locate like that, but for somebody to make the leap to a distressed Americana community, they have to have that working infrastructure. So I think getting that is a prerequisite for, um, for people to locate there. I think there's still going to be times when people have to work in person and have the right nodes. And I think those are gonna to continue to be in the types of areas we saw, but for people to do remote work in the other times, you have to equalize the infrastructure or it's going to continue to divide um, where the opportunity is within uh, the different rural segments. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you, Brian and Sean, for you and your time today for all of the incredible work that went into this paper and the insights that have come out of it. Um, really appreciate you being here today and sharing with us. Um, to everyone on the call, thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who asked questions that weren't answered, um, we will do our best to uh, include responses in the follow-up. Um, and uh, you know, please keep an eye out about a week from now for a follow-up with the recording, with the video, some other resources. And uh, with that, have a wonderful day and thank you again.